We look here, before we get back to the text, let me just look at, um, this is the final statement of the covenant itself. The final, uh, there's not a lot of uh, uh, deep teaching uh, per se, but there is some important things as the, um, the covenant itself is summarized and winding down on the last paragraph. Remember, we looked at five paragraphs in the covenant, which is Article 13 of the Constitution of Center Road Baptist Church. And remember, as we're finishing up this whole series on the book of Nehemiah and practical application of uh, some things through the book of Nehemiah, we land here on the idea that when the people of God were touched by the word of God, they came together and they covenanted one with another. And that was their, that end result of all the great revival that took place, the Bible teaching and responses. And here, similarly, in the New Testament, uh, as, as local New Testament uh, uh, Christians, whether Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. Uh, we all uh, come together. The wall of partition is broken down, the book of Ephesians says, between Jew and Gentile. We're all, in, uh, we're all the same, if you would, in the body of Christ. And, uh, and we covenant one with another, and we come together, just like the Old Testament. And um, so in the covenant, there's five different paragraphs. We've been through that. I'm not going to read the whole thing again, uh, but let me just say in the covenant, in, in, uh, the, chapter, in the, the paragraph one, um, it talks about getting saved, being led of God, and being saved, and then entering into the covenant. And then there's paragraph two, three, and four, and each of those have these st statements and bro breakdowns which we've covered. But then lastly, with all of that, we ended last week on that last little section where it says, we're always ready for reconciliation, and that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, right? And then at the end, here we are, it says, we moreover engage that when we remove from this place... So now the first paragraph is when we're entering in and becoming a member of a church, getting saved, being led of the Holy Spirit, getting saved and becoming a member of a church, right? Now it's like, okay, what if I am going to leave this particular local body of Christ? And that's, and that's so this is the end. One of them is coming out in this last uh, paragraph is if we leave, okay? So it, we moreover engage, remember that word engage, uh, is, is similar throughout the whole thing. It means to think on purpose and, and, uh, and follow through. Uh, that when we remove from this place, we will, as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. So it's a final pledge, if you would, that it, it just like, I'm, basically, if I leave this physical location, I leave this local body, I'm not going to break off the concept and spirit of this covenant. I'm going to go find another one and join to that. Right? So that's the idea um, of the ending of this covenant. And uh, so the reason I bring up, just for a moment, uh, there's a couple things we're going to identify in this paragraph, but the reason I brought up Romans chapter 16 is because if you look at Priscilla and Aquila in verse 3 of Romans 16. Priscilla and Aquila. So, um, and uh, Paul is, is recommending and praising Priscilla and Aquila. And it's because they were helpers. They were helpers of Paul. And notice in verse 4, who have for my life laid down their own neck unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So what does that mean? That means Priscilla and Aquila, man, they traveled around with Paul, right? They were like evangelists, right? They were helpers. They helped him out. He would go start a church, and, or they'd come in, and they'd have conferences and meetings, and Paul was in town. He's going to preach. Maybe they helped out, and they, they broke up and had small groups or whatever. But they traveled, and, and the point, uh, the point I'm, I'm bringing up with this as an illustration is that when they moved around, it was on purpose, that Priscilla and Aquila, when they traveled from church to church to church, because, and then what happened when they came home, what did they do? Let's read the next verse, verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So that when they were traveling with Paul, they were busy, right? They were traveling here and serving the Lord and traveling around. But then when they came home, 
they re-engaged in a local church that actually was meeting in their house. And um, so they're like an example of what we're, what we're talking about when it comes to moving from church to church, but with purpose. Okay? They had a purpose to it. Um, and uh, so that's, it's just very, very important. And um, notice, let me just say, uh, they were, uh, 2 Timothy 4.9 said they were tent makers by trade. Remember, Paul said he was a tent maker. Well, he was making tents with Priscilla and Aquila. And uh, so they were tent makers. Remember, Paul said, look, when I came and preached to you, I didn't, I didn't charge you a dime. I didn't take any money from you. I, I, had, my own, uh, I had my own business on the side. I was self-sufficient. And Priscilla and Aquila helped him do that. They traveled with them. They were in business together, okay? Stay with me. Um, and, uh, and that was 2 Timothy 4.19. Then they came into contact with Paul, who was a tent maker in Corinth. It is not clear whether they became Christians before or after meeting Paul, whether they were already saved before he got there in Acts 18, or uh, he got saved after that because uh, they were in Corinth. It is not, and, and they became workers in the gospel and accompanied Paul to Ephesus, that's Acts 18, 19. And there they instructed Apollos in the Christian faith. Remember, Apollos was a great teacher, a mighty teacher, but he, wasn't, he, was, he, was, he was very gifted and eloquent, but he wasn't even saved. He wasn't preaching truth. So Priscilla and Aquila discipled Apollos, and then Apollos became a great and mighty preacher, uh, preacher for God. But it was Priscilla and Aquila that helped him do that. A church met in their home, and they joined Paul in writing to the Corinthian church. If you look at 1 Corinthians 16, 19, but for time's sake, we won't go there. So they were very much engaged in what Paul was doing. And so what does that translate to you and me? That our involvement in other churches should be on purpose. Amen? If we're going to leave here and go somewhere else, it's very, very important that we don't, um, uh, we don't take lightly uh, the church attendance or the body that you might be involved with that you want to make sure you're praying and thinking about uh, where if you are going to leave that it be of God just like you God just like it starts out having been led verse the very first line having been led as we believe by the spirit of God to receive Christ Right. So the idea is we should follow that and be led as we believe, according to Jesus Christ, to go to somewhere else in the church other than this location. OK, so now, now let me just make a couple quick observations here. Notice it is we moreover engage that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite. Notice it's we moreover engage that when not if. So there's an assumption there, right? It's like Jesus said, when ye pray, not if ye pray, when ye pray. So it's when we, you remove from this place, you will, as soon as possible, unite with some other church. So that's one observation, that it is, it is part of being a New Testament Christian that you're going to, um, uh, you know, I immediately be involved in another church. Now, let me, let me the second observation from this paragraph. Notice the writers of this covenant that have been traditionally, it's a traditionally a Baptist covenant, right? Although everything is just from straight from the Bible. But notice it isn't, it isn't the, there is not a qualifier. Now stay with me on this. Hear me out for the whole point. The qualifier, he didn't say unite with some other Baptist church. Now, the reason being is not just, hey, you know, you know, shoot fast and loose in your denominational affiliation. That's not the point. Because there are denominations that have good in them, right? But I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a Baptist not because I grew up a Baptist. I grew up a Roman Catholic, amen? And I feel led of God in studying the Bible that this is the closest to the New Testament church, right? Can I get an amen on that there, friend? Now, stay with me. But the, the point here is that the true, ch listen to me, the true church of Jesus Christ th from the Jesus and the apostles and Paul and Priscilla and Aquila haven't always been called Cancrea Baptist Church or Priscilla and Aquila Baptist Home Church. They, they didn't always have that name. Does that make sense? Throughout time, 
Um, and I'm actually going to do, that's, that's our next series. I'm doing a little uh, series, and it could be, good heavens, it could be a, you know, a master's course, for crying out loud, in Baptist history. But uh, I want to I teach some concepts about that. But you talk about pe- people that were in the valley, the Piedmont Valley, they were called Piedmontists. People that were Bible believers that preached the gospel, uh, that didn't believe in infant baptism, that uh, believed in believer's baptism, that preached the gospel, that believed in democratic church leadership and calling pastors from their own people, right? Rising up out of not a separate clergy class and all the different, uh, whether you put seven or 10 or 11 or 12, many, there's different lists of what are, are the, the earmarks of a New Testament church, the marks of a New Testament church. I'm going to talk about that, but, uh, but whatever they are, uh, they weren't always called Baptist. It, some, they were, they were from the city of Lyons, France. They were called Lyonists. Some followed uh, uh, Peter of Brucia. They were called, Peter, uh, uh, they were called Petrobrussians. Because they made, or Peter Waldo, right? They were called Waldensians. Or, and, and they were called, whether it was a physical location or whether they were called uh, uh, by a, a particular leader that God raised up. And they were called after that leader. Some were called Paulicians after Paul in the New Testament. So they were called and they earmarked for doctrine, not a physical location or a, a particular preacher or leader. But, if, but from, you know, from... Uh, um, um, uh, or called Paulicians, they, were, they had doctrinal uh, uh, differences. And, uh, or Donatists, Numidians, Novatians. And, uh, and then it was really the, what are called the, uh, the radical uh, reformation. Or, or those that were in the radical the Reformation and you know the 15 early 1500s of course with Martin Luther and then in, and then it went all over in England of course and John Calvin and in Geneva Switzerland with Calvin and then uh, and then Ulrich Zwingli and then under and then a, and a lot that happened it's remarkable in the Netherlands there that there was people that thought hey they didn't come out far enough that there were people that were trained as Roman Catholics that. Uh, maybe they came out from that and got involved in what was the Protestant Reformation, right? But there were some that didn't believe that, you know, Calvin or Martin Luther or Zwingli or many of these other uh, famous uh, leaders that, you know, the Church of England, that we know that those denominations still survive today, right? From the movement of these people in the early 1500s. But there were people that said, you're just not coming out far enough, brother. And they, came, they kept saying, the Bible's here, Roman Catholicism here. You didn't come out far enough. You've got to come out all the way. And they didn't. And those people that kept going, were called, many of them, uh, you know, they renounced the, the infant baptism. And uh, in particular, uh, Zwingli there, uh, he w- began to question and in teaching at the local college there, began to question infant baptism, and he began to teach on it, and other people, uh, 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 Mains and Blaurock, these other leaders that were underneath him, that studied with him, and then studied underneath him, uh, then they, but they submitted to a board that was running the city, the council. And Zwingli was like, well, whatever the council says. And these boys are like, it's already, it's already determined by God. The Bible says you ought not be baptized in babies. It's after you believe as an adult. And um, so, and it got so bad that, that that town passed a law that you have to baptize your infants or you're going to be drowned to death. And of course, uh, you, know, they, you know, there's 50 million uh, Bible believers that were murdered through the Dark Ages. And uh, for, the very th- for the very simple thing of not wanting to baptize their infant according to their conscience in the Bible. And though so they came out and many of them were hunted down and butchered and murdered. Uh, men, women and children because of a simple thing like my conscience tells me I ought not baptize my infant. And those, so they became, they began, so they would baptize, they were baptized as infants, and then they would get baptized later on. So they were called Anna or rebaptizers. You baptize and again, what are you doing that for? So that's where the word Anabaptist comes from in mid 1500s and onward. But, but so that's, and that's, a, that's a longer take, of course. But the point is, is, 
the idea is just it says the word church, but that is a true New Testament church. Regardless of what the name says on the, the shingle, okay? And throughout history. Does that make sense? There are still Hutterites today. There are still Waldensians today, Mennonites and Amish. All these people were like splinter groups from this Anabaptist movement in the early 1500s. And um, so, does that make sense, what I'm saying about that? So that's why it's not, the name doesn't, he didn't qualify Baptist because it's like, man, well, anything goes, man. As long as it says church or community center or, you know, the pond or whatever, you know. It's cool. It's not cool. You got to find out what they teach doctrinally. Amen? For it to be a New Testament church, regardless of its moniker. Okay? Does that make sense? So it's not, it's when, not if. And it's a true New Testament church, regardless of the name. And I guarantee there are some, I'll tell you this, I believe there are some. You know, Bible churches that are more Baptist churches than Baptist churches. Did you get what I just said? There are some perhaps non, uh, they, you know, they don't have a particular name. They're called like the church at whatever, Ville. And that could be more biblically sound and Baptist oriented than somebody that has the word Baptist in their name. OK, so so that's why it's important if you are going to leave, that you make sure that there's that you're being led of the spirit and that you will unite with some other church. But it's a it's a it's a bona fide New Testament church. Amen. And amen. So let me just make two quick observations and I'll be done. First of all, uh, what about uh, the negative side uh, of moving from a community in a church? Now, let me just say this. Um, the local church, while we are emphasizing the importance of local church membership, this is not a cult. Okay? You know, there's not like people standing at, the, well, there is people standing at the door. <laughs> you know, they're not, yeah, look at them. Look how mean they are. It's, <laughs> they're not going to hunt you down and, you know, put you in stocks and throw tomatoes at you, amen, if you leave this church. Say, fooey on, fooey on parati and, you know, this, this stuff's a mess and whatever, whatever. Oh, get them! You know, that's not, not going to happen here, okay? So, and now, I'll be honest with you. There have been, there's some Baptist churches that it's, it gets almost cultic. Where if you leave or whatever and, you know, you're expressing your Christian liberty... And you're, you know, uh, you get shunned when you're, you know, bumping into each other at Walmart. We're not a cult, friend. While I believe in the importance of the New Testament church. And if there is some movement from here to somewhere else, make sure you're being led of the spirit. It's like you were led in that you get led out. Okay? So, but that's not a light thing is the point. But that doesn't mean it's an exclusive thing. Okay? I'm not Jim Jones, and we're not having Kool-Aid for after church fellowship. Someone say amen, okay? Okay? Even though he was called a fundamentalist, you know, Jim Jones, right? But uh, does that make sense? I, I know a story of a, of a, there was a husband and wife, and they felt led of God to move, and the pastor, true story, challenged them and said, you know, I just don't believe you guys should go. Now, they felt liberty. They really did. Well, the pastor just was like, no, because he didn't want to lose them, right? They were busy. They served the Lord. They loved the Lord. He didn't want to lose them. So he counseled them to stay. And uh, long story short, it, 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 just, it just kept, it just went spiraled downward. Long story short, they got a divorce and their lives were messed up. Now, and there's a lot to that, to unpack about that, just that scenario. But the point I'm saying is, it, it isn't always the case that everybody has to be in the sound of their voice in this church. Amen? I, I can't preach the liberty and the priesthood of the believer, which is a Bible doctrine for a New Testament church. 
the priesthood of the believer. What does that mean? That you do according to what your conscience says between you and God. I'm not the fourth part of the Trinity. That would make it a quadrinity? I, I'm not sure, but anyway. Uh, so, I, you follow what I'm saying? That's between you and God. There's liberty here. We can't say liberty in Christ, freedom in Christ, except when you leave this place. We're coming after you. I, right? Now, so there's a negative side of that, right? Now, uh, and you want to be careful, right? I mean, I know some folks that may have chased a job. Like, this job sounds great, whatever, whatever, whatever. And all of their spiritual assessments were just not even, they weren't even an issue. Yeah, I'll figure it out later. This is a great job. And never even went into and evaluated and looked at, is there a good church in the area? Never even checked it out. And it messed them up. Long term, long time. Are you with me? So you got to balance all this stuff out is what I'm saying. It's important. It's not exclusive like we're a cult. It's, it's important, right? You know, it's not like, you know, it's not like, uh, what's, what's Tom Cruise's gig? Scientology, Scientology okay. That if you go, you know, you're going to be, you know, ha hunted down and all this stuff, right? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Strike that from the internet. I'm going to have, they're going to hunt me down. Amen. Tom Cruise is going to come to my door and get mad at me, I think. Um, <clears throat> so, the idea is do you follow the Lord, not the pastor, right? But let me say there's a positive side, right? Because there is, there is a time if a church begins to make bad decisions, about the leadership and the vision of that church, that you, I believe, that that's where it's like, I, I, things are not working out here, I need to go. Out of your fidelity to the Lord, not just out of, hey, I just want to get out of here, there's too much pressure here, I'm going to, you know, having itching ears, I'm going to get tickled somewhere else, I'm going to get scratched a little bit somewhere else. But there's a, so, but there is a very real an important time when you need to leave a local New Testament church. If the teaching and the doctrine begins to waver in, in, in that pulpit especially. And, um, and it's moving in different directions. And um, that maybe it is an important issue to, uh, to move. You know, because let me just say this. God's not going to leave you. Or I'm sorry, God's not going to lead you to a place where there's no community of faith. I don't believe that. I believe God is will lead you, whether it's professionally or to a maybe a young person. You're going to meet some some opposite gender person online and it's great and all that. And then it's like, yeah, but they live in Timbuktu and there's not a church within 150 miles. I would challenge you to reevaluate that. Because God's not going to lead you into a desert. Now, I, I mean, yes, spiritually, there's going to be some times that God may lead you in desert times. OK, but that's a spiritual thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a community of believers. God intends for his children. Bible says God setteth the solitary in families. Just like we're born into a family unit, so we're born again and require a family unit to function and grow in a healthy manner. Does that make sense? So I believe that. I, re I really believe that, that this is very important. That if we do leave, you want to make sure there's a good professing a community of believers in that location. If you're going to be to leave to a, another location or professionally or a job or whatever, whatever, whatever. That's all very important. So why? So you can carry out the spirit of this covenant in the principles of God's word. Amen? Amen and amen. So um, with that, uh, I appreciate that. I, I certainly have been changed by the study in Nehemiah and, uh, and want to continue to grow and build and work together like Nehemiah, right, in review. You know, Nehemiah, they built the wall, they rose up, they rose up and built the wall. The Bible says the people had a mind to work, 
right, to work together and their synergy together, they got stuff done. So I never want to forget that uh, in the heritage of that lesson 